everybody. This is Joanna Schaffner Scott, and you are listening to the Race in the Workplace podcast, a show for DEI organizational leaders that explores race, racism, and racial equity in the workplace. I am a racial equity consultant and founder of the Stamey Street Consulting Group, a consulting firm that specializes in partnering with organizations to help them meet their racial equity aspirations. My goal for you is to move your organization from being colorblind to equity-centered through sustainable step-by-step changes. Hi, it's Joanna Schaffner-Scott here. I am so excited to be with you today. Thank you for allowing me to join you in your day, no matter when you're listening. In this bonus episode of the podcast, you will hear a conversation between me and HR expert Sandra Newman that was a part of a interview series called Changing the Conversation. The series featured 14 dynamic voices, including my own, that explores the power of effective communication and bridging gaps, fostering understanding and finding common ground in our work and personal lives. In this interview with me, you will hear my thoughts on ways to navigate roadblocks to effective communications in the workplace. I thought the points that we discussed could help folks navigating these kinds of conversations. So I'm sharing the interview with you. So there's one little tidbit that I want to share right here at the top. Sandra asked me about major challenges that I see in workplaces. And the first thing I said was the most major challenge I see in organizations navigating communications is trying to have difficult conversations without the proper tools. We talked a lot about that. So to hear more of the interviews in Sandra's series, visit changingtheconversationseries.com. I'll say that again, changingtheconversationseries.com. All right, let's get into it. Here is my conversation with Sandra Newman. Welcome back, everybody, to Changing the Conversation. I'm your host, Sandra Newman, and I am very excited today to have Joanna Scott with us. Welcome. Hi. And we are going to dive into communication as we consider each other's differences, because obviously that makes everything go a little bit more smoothly. So welcome, Joanna. And I'd love for you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Sure, sure. So I think it's important to start with my background, because it's very different than the work I do now. So my background is actually public policy. So I worked for a long time at the doing state budget analysis, and then I uh, did, did child advocacy work for a national nonprofit for a number of years. It was there that I started doing what is now DEI, but at the time I cons- was racial equity work. And I always call myself a reluctant consultant because I have this like whole other work <laughs> history before becoming a consultant. And honestly, I don't know anybody who in life dreamed to be a consultant. So that's... <laughs> Uh, It's totally a jagged journey for me. But my work as a racial equity consultant started, basically I was voluntold. Like the person who was leading the work left the organization and I was sort of told like, this is now your work. At the time, I I really resisted and didn't want to do it. And now I know that's how a lot of Black women enter into this space is it is additional duty on top of what you're already doing. And that was the case for me as well. Um, It certainly has worked out for me, but it was definitely what I call a jagged journey in terms of how I got to this place where now I work with clients all over the country who want to be more equitable in their workplaces. Yeah. And I, and, you know, I think that's always true. Like I very rarely talk to anybody who started on it. Well, I shouldn't say that my husband was a teacher for 25 years. And I think in some paths you do start in one thing and you you continue on that path. But I think it's much more common that we all kind of take this jagged path. And I always find those stories fascinating with how people get to where they're going. <laughs> yeah. You know, and sometimes it's like your family situation changes or something big in your life changes and it sort of takes you off the path that you thought you were going to be on. So that definitely was my situation. Yeah, absolutely. So in the work that you're doing now, what are some, I guess, common roadblocks or themes that you're seeing of the struggles that companies are having when they bring you in, in terms of communication in their, in their workplace? That's such a great question. I'm so excited to, to dig into it. I think people struggle a lot by trying to have conversations without the proper tools. So I'll come into an engagement, maybe somebody hires me to facilitate 
a difficult conversation or maybe they'll hire me because they want to do a training or they want to do a deeper engagement, whatever that is. I almost always find that whether it's nonprofits or philanthropies or business, that there's an effort underway to try to have these very deep conversations without the necessary tools to make that a space where people feel both safe, but also heard and their opinions valued. So it's sort of like, I always liken it to diving into a deep end of of the pool when you've only had one swim lesson. And so sometimes it's like, wait a second, we're not ready for this conversation. There's some trust building. There's other things that have to need to happen before you have this very big, deep conversation about people's experiences, especially when we're talking about issues of identity. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's been a theme through a lot of the conversations I've been having is there's so much focus on the conversations themselves and not enough focus on what we do to bring ourselves. Yes. And what we understand of ourselves (laughs) and what experiences are tinting our own perception. And then also being able to recognize that, that the person on the other side has experiences that are tinted as well. Absolutely. Because workplaces are a microcosm of our society. And that is borrowing from uh, uh, Victor Ray, who wrote this great article about why organizations stay white. And so we have to sort of approach it from that way. And sometimes it's very different than I encounter managers a lot of times who really struggle with that. Because we're all coming, just like you said, we're all coming to work with a set of experiences. And everybody's experiences are valuable and that there's not one particular experience that's more valuable than the other, but we have to account for all of them. And so sometimes as managers struggle with understanding, not only are we coming in with different experiences, but the way we're experiencing management or the way we're experiencing that organization is also very different, right? And so those are things we have to navigate when we're thinking about how we're going to communicate with each other. It comes into the perception. You know, I think I I heard something recently that talked about how Eyewitness accounts are one of the most unreliable things in a, you know, like talking about, let's say, a criminal case or, a, a, you know, some type of, you know, situation where that's involved. And you would think, well, that doesn't sound right. But two people can literally be standing in the exact same place watching the same thing and experience it completely different. Absolutely. I mean, how many of us would say that if we grew up with siblings, like my experience (laughs) growing up is very different than my siblings. And so even though we're literally in the same house, so it's like, it's the same kind of dynamic for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, yeah. And it's just fascinating, you know, how that happens, even if you're just sitting there, you know, watching a news story and you just filter it through your own experiences. And, um, you know, I've been on this kick of, I guess you call it maybe a micro obsession now on the the science behind how our brains work and Mm -hmm. (laughs) like how we filter all those things into. So that just adds us to a whole nother layer. It does, but it's important (laughs) to think about because if you enter into a conversation, understanding that everybody's coming in with a different not only different expectations of the conversation, which is important to set that context, but also a different experience of a manager or a different experience of an organization that you should conduct that conversation with all of that in mind. And even more reason to go into it with some basic tools to work with. Yeah. So what would be one of the the types of tools that you would, you know, encourage these, these clients to consider or maybe prep work that they need to do before they really dive into these conversations to make them worthwhile? Sure. So I always suggest that any sort of gathering of staff or employees, whether it's a team meeting, a one-on-one, an all staff, whatever the gathering is, that there should be some sort of conversation agreement that's a part of that. And conversation agreements are how we agree as an entity, whether it's a team, department, whatever, whatever the configuration, that we're agreeing how we're going to engage each other in this space. So for example, if we have a conversation agreement around respect, like respect is one of our values, how do we build that into our conversation agreement is respect is one of our values. So we're not going to interrupt people when they're talking. We're going to let folks, we agree that we're going to let everyone finish their point. If timeliness is important, we're not going to repeat each other. If there's a point already been made, we're going to plus one it and move on. But it just sort of gives people a way of agreeing and being a part of that process to say, this is how I want to engage. This is how I feel most most safe engaging in this conversation. And also what I can expect from this conversation. So it's very important. 
rarely do folks do it when I first start working with them. So that's one of the first things we do is to set some almost boundaries, but not quite that rigid, but create some understanding about how to engage each other when we're gathered to talk about work. Yeah, I love that. I can't think of, I mean, I think there's always, you know, you get a sense of what some of the guidelines are just from observing behavior. You know, you saw you start in a new job, you see how your new boss manages the meeting and you kind of get a feel for like what's important to them. And, but to truly set it out, I think that's fabulous. I can't say I've ever um, experienced that myself. And I think that that's a, a great way to do it, to make sure everybody is on the same page. For sure. And we we already know that socially, you know, women tend to get interrupted more. Sometimes women will make a point and it sort of sort of kind of fly, you know, kind of disappears into the sky, but a male can make the same point and everybody suddenly hears that. So it's just it's a way to make sure that the space is as equitable as it can be for whatever whatever work needs to happen in that space. Yeah, that's a great tip. <laughs> <laughs> like people want to have these very deep conversations and it's like, wait, 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 like, like, how do I know I'm going to be safe in that space? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And, you know, we've already, if anybody that's been watching these, we have had a conversation about respect in the world and just even the definition of respect. Yes. And what we feel like is like, you talked about timeliness and you talked about, you know, not interrupting and, you know, whereas one person could be, well, of course you show up on time and another person be like, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, like my day's flexible and, you know, that's just how I roll. And, you know, so if you don't understand the person is not being rude necessarily, they're just coming at it from a completely different space. Yes. And that I want to just pick up on a point that you made around defining respect. That's another, I think, a roadblock to communications that I see in organizations that I work with is that there's not enough time given to defining what these big concepts mean. So respect, we unpack it in my work. Like, what does that mean? For some people, it could mean you're not interrupting when I'm talking. For other people, it means being on time. For other people, it means I can say my opinion. It can be hard. And I expect not to be attacked personally, but give feedback on the idea. But unless we unpack it, we're all coming into a space with different understandings of even what it means to be respected. So we have to talk about that. Do you know what I mean? If you're not starting from the same base ground, yes. then you're never going to get anywhere. And then I think that can be applied to just about any conversation or any relationship. Yes. Um, you know, every misunderstanding that we've ever had, especially, you know, in our personal relationships, you know, the, now you add emotion to it, but it's usually because you're coming from just a completely different place that you don't realize. Like, I don't know how many times, you know, even just my husband and I have had conversations and I at one way, and then all of a sudden he'll say something. I'm like, I like that wasn't even on my radar. Like now it makes sense. You know what you're saying. I understand now. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. And the other thing that I see is that people lots of times confuse intent with impact. So someone will say something that maybe it landed wrong on somebody else or someone was hurt by it, whatever it was. And then their first response is, I didn't mean to. And and I think that's important. Okay. But then we also have to take ownership of the impact of our words. And so I always ask folks to hold those two together, like to own, yes, I didn't mean to do it. And I also understand that that landed wrong with you. And I apologize for that. But just to hold both of those at the same time, because we tend to gravitate toward intent. Like I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, mean to, and then sort of leave out like what the impact of the speech was or the words or that, or whatever, um, whatever was happening in the dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of, and and this uh, feels like it comes up a lot, but that you judge yourself and your intentions and you judge others on their actions. I don't know originally. I can't give props there, but it's absolutely true. You know, just like you're driving in a car and you accidentally cut somebody off and you're like, well, why are they yelling at me? I didn't mean to do it. And I, I was like, you know, the kid was screaming in the back of the seat or I was distracted by this bicycle over here or whatever the case was. But as soon as somebody else cuts you off, it's like, well, well, they're just being rude <laughs> or something yeah. worse. Um, yeah. And, and so a lot of times conversations go awry. Hold intent and impact is would be one of a conversation agreement I would recommend and hope that hope that a client takes because that matters if you're going to have any type of communication about work that if somebody says something that lands wrong to just own it. And and that leads to the last thing that I often see is when that kind of mistake happens, 
it's not enough just to say I made a mistake, but actually do better, right? Like we all make mistakes, but I know in times in my own life, when somebody says something that lands with me the wrong way, or even something really offensive that, and I call them on it and say, Hey, you know, that didn't, that wasn't cool. The ability to be able to say, you know what, that wasn't cool. My bad. And then work on not doing it again. (laughs) Because that builds trust. I think everybody can connect with, I made a mistake, right? But I think the other part of it, actually doing the work of communicating better, being more clear, especially if you know you're, you, that communication is a challenge, doing better, being more clear, that builds trust with other folks on your team because they can see that you're working on it. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Are there any other kind of big roadblocks that you see coming into these conversations or ones that seem to be more open to Mm -hmm. fixing these types of issues? I will say overall, I think most organizations of every kind, whether it's nonprofit or, or business or most organizations don't put enough time into building trust the level or the depth of conversation and communication that you can have inside an organization is directly connected to the level of trust. And I don't mean trust like we're going to do a trust fall. I mean, like <laughs> I mean, uh, one of my colleagues talks about get to know you bingo. I, I always think of that. But but real trust around showing up, how people show up, doing what you say you're going to do, meeting your deadline, all of those things contribute to trust. And I don't think enough people put time into building trust and talking about how we show up for each other, how you show up in teams, how our work connects together. It's mostly like doing, 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 doing. And in in the equity space, that trust building part is the work too, because without that, all of this becomes difficult. And I always say, if I can't ask the person next to me to stop burning popcorn, then we, you know, in the microwave, <laughs> then we can't have a deeper conversation. We don't have the tools. So I think more time needs to be put into, no, and I don't mean it in like a feel good kind of way. Cause some people may, are uncomfortable with that too, but I mean, what it looks like in terms of um, a well-functioning team. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and that's true. You know, we, I've also been having this lot of conversations about things being hard. And I think that's why a lot of people avoid some of these things because they think that this is too hard and I'm just going to take the easy way out, not recognizing that you're making every other interaction after that 10 times as hard Harder. as it mm-hmm. could have been. <laughs> right. It's just a little bit uncomfortable now. <laughs> yes. It's either you spend the time on the front or you spend the time in the back. Um, you do spend the time on the front, like getting, like doing this work, this piece of work that we're talking about, or you spend on the, the time on the back repair, doing repair where you've got ruptures in relationships. You've got people on the same team who don't speak. I mean, that kind of stuff. So it's going to take time either way. It's just how you decide to spend it. One is more proactive. The other, of course, is more reactive. And that's what we're conditioned to kind of run through our day, you know, for whatever reason, you know, we're distracted by a zillion things or that's just how we've been taught and we haven't been given the tools to go into those conversations and have them earlier, you know, when they're not as hard. (laughs) Yes. And respect that one, one way that we're different is that some people are going to go to work to go to work and they're only going to share so much and that has to be okay too. Right. Mm -hmm. But unless you talk about it, it sort of floats out there. And, and that's part of this conversation around creating a well-functioning equitable team that we can show up who we are and that's okay. So for sure, <laughs> then that yeah. lends right into your work. Like now you're in HR, like now, yeah. you're, now there's an issue when we can, yeah. just, you know, think about it proactively. Do you know what I mean? And that seems to be a lot of, um, you know, the conversation is we end up having the conversation once things have gotten bad Yes. and rather than understanding that, you know, and I, and I've said this, I don't know how many of these conversations I've been saying this, I feel like a broken record in some cases, but you know, like around performance conversations, they've just gotten it. And all of these hard conversations, whether it's performance conversations, whether it's, you know, these types of, you know, bigger issues in the workplace around equity, around differences, they've just gotten this bad rap. You know, we've, how long have we been able to talk? We don't talk about that. Yes. <laughs> Like avoid that conversation. We don't talk about that topic, you know, avoid that at all costs, you know, at the, at the family dinner table or, you know, with your coworkers, we don't talk about that stuff, but we've turned it into something that is scary when if it's broken down into littler pieces or you have it 
you ease into the bigger ones, then it's not as scary. I think think that's right. Because I think what you mentioned too, I've seen a lot too, where people don't get is around feedback. Feedback is an excellent example where people don't get good feedback and then even defining what feedback is and how you want to receive it until performance review. So what that not only is it anxiety producing, but it's also like, wait a second, you mean I've been awful for eight months <laughs> that that doesn't have to be the only kind of planned conversation. And even, even performance review, I would still use a conversation agreement around, around framing that conversation. But those are the kinds of things that people also resent. You know what I mean? Like, why didn't you tell me this? That kind of thing. Cause people don't want to have that that, that confrontation when it doesn't have to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we make, actually, this was part of a conversation I just had this morning is that you like may know that what somebody else is doing, or you judge what somebody else is doing as wrong or bad or inappropriate or whatever the case may be. And you want to assume that that person knows too. Yes. Yes. And one, you don't know what their background is. And as I mentioned this to somebody this morning, We have this amazing ability to rationalize anything. (laughs) And it's, you know, you can act in ways that somebody else feels are really inappropriate and you completely rationalize it in your own head. And until you're approached with it and you have the opportunity to realize its effect and then make changes, it's not, you can't assume that the other person knows that they're doing it and on purpose. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. And I think this is a place that more companies can be really proactive about. So if it's performance review, one, having more conversations other than performance review, but but even at performance review time, like that's a great time to do a little training on active listening. That's a good time to do a training on conflict resolution. Like, what are you going to do if you hear something, if the person disagrees, how are you going to navigate that conflict and doing a little mini training around that so that folks feel a little bit more prepared for those conversations. I don't know if they're ever comfortable no matter what side of the disc you're sitting on, but you can certainly help people feel more confident and more competent going into those kind of conversations. I had a a boss once, not in my current job, but years ago, bring up something at a performance for you and say, well, this came up in a conversation, you know, like where it was like a round table thing that he did with employees, you know, like, and yeah. And so it was confidential. It was not. And so, you know, therefore I couldn't share it with you. Well, Do you really think that I would, you know, have acted or said something insensitive on purpose to that Mm -hmm. employee? And if I didn't know that they took it that way, how do you expect me to fix it? (laughs) Yeah. But again, it probably came from an assumption that I knew what I was doing it, that it was insensitive. Well, that doesn't put a lot of faith in me, but you don't always know the impact. No matter how self-aware you are, you don't always know unless somebody tells you. Agreed. I also think that being able to name when those things happened also has to be agreed upon among the team. And that, and in a way that's more than just informal, it is if we're going to agree that we're going to be that honest with each other, there's a little bit of practice that goes with that. And I think in some cases, some policy that goes with that too, around exactly how we do that. Because there's different ways to do that. I can say, you said this, which probably <laughs> in some cases is appropriate, but but yeah. not always the most effective. And in other cases that, you know, that calling out is not always helpful and it's embarrassing and it's just, it's often not as effective. But I also think that there's space for calling in like, hey, this happened. I want to talk to you about it. But that we have to get to a place of trust where we can even do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think most people rely on calling out. You said this and that, like I said, sometimes it is appropriate. Most times it's not though. Most times it won't. If the desired outcome is like a reconnection in the relationship and a change in behavior, then embarrassing somebody is not the way to go. It just isn't. No, absolutely. And and again, that comes back to having those agreements and in place, you know, because it it all starts before you get to these problems. You have to have them in place in order to make sure that the conversations don't go astray to begin with. And Um, they will. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much guaranteed. (laughs) They will. They will every time, whether, you know, it's on purpose or not, they will, because those kinds of agreement, they help create 
agreed upon ways of engaging. And in that example with someone, maybe gotten some feedback, like, well, how long do we wait before we give the feedback? Like those kinds of things. Is it in the moment? Sometimes people can't articulate things in the moment. Is it within a week? Is it, is it, I mean, hopefully it's not months later. That's not helpful. So it's just thinking all of these things through in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's never too late. It's never too late (laughs) to start adding this little bit of structure to gathering times in organizations. So we've talked about some of the, you know, the problems that you see when they come in. So what are some of, of the benefits to kind of going through this process? Are there outcomes that were a little bit more surprising or that teams experienced like ben- certain benefits of going through this that maybe weren't expected? I think a colleague of mine did a navigating difficult conversations uh, workshop for a team recently. And I think one of the things that was a benefit and also somewhat, so I don't know if it was surprising. It was, I was pleased to see it was kind of talking through some of the challenges that different people on the team had experienced and and the way they talk about their equity work that other people didn't know. So it's this kind of shared experience of this is what someone said to me, or this is what I've heard, or and kind of dumping all that like a backpack, dumping out your backpack on the table and kind of sorting it through. And it gave them the opportunity as a team to sort things through and then to think about, well, how do we want to say that? What well, is the message that we want to send? And it and it's interest. It was so interesting because the work happens so fast that often we don't take those moments to even like debrief on what have you heard, what's been said, but also like how do we want to show up? Do you know what I mean? Especially if it's if, if it's a big project. And so that's one of the benefits is a space for shared communication around pieces of work, shared learning. And shared experience. Because a lot of times you we we hold that. And because when we go to a meeting, we're talking about this, 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 and this, whatever that's on your list, but it's not the learning or the sharing of experience around how our work is filtering out. Yeah. And it's stories. I mean, I but that's something oh, I stories powerful, yes. Fascinating. Yes. You know, because it's one, it's all the stories that come out when you really take the time to listen to somebody um, of learning about their experience and open yourself up to something maybe you'll never experience or that you've never looked at. Um, but then it gives you a window into that person, which then makes those work conversations more productive. Absolutely. And I think another benefit is there can be a set of of expectations that are clearly communicated as I I think they should be clearly communicated. And we, even if we don't like each other, we can still function from a space of honesty and understanding what is expected. Because I think a lot of times people don't often understand what's expected of them because sometimes managers aren't always clear in communicating that clear about tasks not expectations. And so that's another benefit is to get very clear on those expectations and to operate from a place of honesty. It doesn't mean everyone's going to love each other on the team. We're all people. There is always going to be conflict anytime you gather more than two people, but that honesty, I think is important. Yeah. And, and again, you know, it's also making space. Yes, you can get to know, but like you said before, not everybody's going to be comfortable Mm -hmm. sharing all of that, but if they can at least share, you know, the basic facts of there is something in my past that makes this important to me. You know, like you don't necessarily have to know the whole story behind it, but you know, whether it's punctuality or whether it's, you know, how we talk. I mean, I come from, well, my part of my mom's side of the family is Italian. It's also the New York. It's the hands thing. And it's the talking, <laughs> talking, and the talking over each other. I can't get, you know, it's, it's been diluted a little bit, but it's still there. It's pretty strong. Just getting used to that being normal. Like there's 15 conversations going on at the same time with five people, you know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that's possible, but there was, you know, <laughs> but not everybody comes from that. They're used to one person talking and then another person talking and, you know, and it's finding, yeah, actually this reminds me, my book club is like this. I have an in-person book club and we have a tendency to do that. When we start talking, we start talking over each other. There's a conversation here, a conversation there, a conversation. And we warn people when they're new that this is how we do things. But the, I guess, kind of, I don't know if it's a compromise, but the flip side of it is we end every meeting with each person getting their space to share their rating of the book, but it allows them to share their thoughts that didn't already get heard. And that's the point where we're not talking over each other. Every person gets their one. Yeah. To say what they want. Everybody's listening. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, that matters because some of us, I include myself in this, in this group of people who I can talk and think, and I'm doing all at the same time. Like I can, sometimes I process very fast like that. Other folks just don't feel comfortable or can't, right? For whatever reason, maybe they don't feel comfortable. They want to think about what they want to say first. And so, or they just take longer to process. So I think the way to make space, I think the way is to make space for the the differences in people and the way they communicate and then the way they process, like your like your book club example. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually hadn't thought about it that way until I said it. But you know, I've always been comfortable in the atmosphere, but I'm sure that there's people that aren't that are comfortable, but at least that gives them that we get we get both. We get a yes. little bit of both worlds. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's just like on Zoom. Some people will raise their hand and talk. Some people will never raise their hand and talk and they'll they're all in the chat. You know yeah. what I mean? It's just it's just part of the differences that people bring and how they communicate. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I've been doing in a lot of these interviews is there's obviously a lot here. There's a lot of, you know, so many different ways that this conversation could go. There's so many different topics we could dive into. And sometimes it feels like this big project to take something out of it. You know, we go to trainings and we're like, okay, now what do I do with all that? Right. That's important. (laughs) Yeah. So what would you say is one thing that somebody could do to take the first step, whether it was on their team or in their workplace to start making progress? That's a great question. I think that one thing that people can do, if you like to take any action on what I've said, is to think about what kind of guidance can you put in in place for your next team meeting or your next one-on-one and ask for feedback around that. Like if you're a manager and you do weekly one-on-ones, like I do one-on-ones with my team, Um, We always have an agenda, for example, always, or think about the conversation agreement and ask like how before the meeting, not in the meeting, before the meeting, ask, what do you need to make this conversation more productive? Or what do you need to feel more heard in this conversation and really listen and then make the change? So it doesn't have to be a whole list of conversation agreements. I do work that way around with bigger teams and all staff situations. But I think asking that question um, from a manager asking to uh, folks that report to that person, what do you need to make this conversation more productive so that you feel heard, you get through your list, I get through my list. How can we structure this conversation in a different way? Yeah, that's great. It's more about that preparation and, you know, getting the ground rules set, even if it's just a simple, simple one. Absolutely. Before the conversation, because in it, I'm trying to work through my list. Yeah. (laughs) 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 Absolutely. All right. Well, this has been fabulous. I so appreciate you having this conversation with me and taking the time out. For those of you that want to know more about what Joanna does, it will be farther down on underneath this interview where you can get all of her contact information, some tools I think that she has on her website that can help you start these conversations. And again, yeah, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Have a great day, everybody. And we will see you on the next one. Take care. That's this week's episode of Race in the Workplace. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast and share it with a friend who may be a DEI professional who can use these strategies in their work. My hope for the podcast is that it reaches every person who needs it. Until next time, take care.